Well, good morning and welcome to the city. We are so glad to have you guys with us on this morning. To all of those who are tuning in online all over the world in different parts of this incredible country and state that we live in, we just want to let you know that you guys mean so much to us. You are a part of our family. We are praying for you, and we're believing God's very best in your life. Can we give them a hand as well? Amen. Well, over the last week, I started to kind of talk about the next. You know, we talked about next steps last week and what it looks like for us to begin to make a difference. Because I really believe that it is our desire that we were actually created to make a difference. That you weren't just created to do a job, work 40 years, retire, maybe go on a few cool vacations, buy some amazing tennis shoes, and then just roll on in your life. But there's actually purpose to who you are. Amen? So today I want to talk and I want to speak into that purpose a little bit because in Psalms 16 verse 11, David actually talks about this specific thing. In fact, he taught, when he's talking to, to God, he reveals something by saying, you will show me the way of life. How many of you in the room, and I need you to be really honest, like, don't, there's no shame or condemnation. How many of you really, really want God to show you what your true purpose is? Just raise your hand. Come on, like, I want to know my, like, all right, look around. You're not by yourself. Look around. There's a lot of people here, right? So, so this is not something that is weird. It's not something uncommon. But it is something that we're not usually willing to talk about because as you see by the show of hands, there are a lot of us who have not yet discovered our purpose. And David said, listen, you're going to show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your what? Like how many of you love worship? Look at all the, the same amount of hands. Praise God, right? Right, we love it because we get into his presence, right? And when we get into the presence of God, we feel as though there is hope. We can let our burdens down, our guards down. We can trust God and we can be vulnerable in his presence. So he's saying, listen, God wants to show you the way of life so that you can keep your joy by staying in his presence. But what I love about it is it doesn't stop there because you weren't just created for heaven. You were created for earth too. Because it goes on to say, and the pleasures of living what? With you. So there's some pleasure. Look at your neighbor and say, we ought to be enjoying this thing. We ought to be enjoying this thing, right? Life is meant to be enjoyed, but the problem is we have misconstrued and we have misidentified what joy actually looks like. Because the enemy attacks our joy because he knows, as the word declares, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So if he can take your joy, he can take your strength. And then when you get weak, you become vulnerable to deception. Boy, that's a good word. I'm preaching right now. I'm preaching right now. That wasn't even in my notes. Praise the Lord. So let me share with you what our desire is for every person who walks through our door, every person who is in bed at home, watching online, wherever they are, every person that we come in contact with or will ever come in contact with, we have some desires for everyone. And one of the first desires we have as a church, the city, this is what we hang our hat on, is we want every person we encounter at whatever level God will give us, is we want everybody to know God. And we, amen, we don't want them to know him in their head, we want them to know him in their heart. Right? I always say we don't want you to know about him, we want you to know him. We want you to know God on an intimate, alive level. Listen to me. God is alive. He is alive. And everything that he touches comes back to life. So God touched me again. Come on. Right? Touch us again. So once you get to know God, then what happens in the process is God says, once you get to know me, then I want to do something in you. 
right? So it says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So we want you to know God because when you know God, then you'll have power. And then the power will give you the ability to find freedom through family. We do that in groups. So, so God wants you to find this freedom f- from the past. Healing from the past. Right? The setbacks, the disappointments, the mistakes. But you can't find freedom until you know him. We've been trying to get free our whole lives. Let me tell you, what did David say? When I knew you, you show me the way. of you, The way is through him. Say it's him. Yeah. It's him. So when we get to know him, then we can have access to this freedom. And then once we get free, we begin to discover who we are. What's our purpose? I'm going to say this to you guys. I want you to listen real, real, real good. You'll never know what your purpose is for the future until you settle the past from yesterday. Because God will never take you to a place when all the while you'll look back from where you were. He won't do it. He won't do it. You look at Lot's wife. He told all of them, don't look back. If you do, you're going to turn to a pillar of salt. You know what salt does? It becomes flavor for other things. When you begin to look back, you no longer become, you no longer become the, the nutrient, the meat. You just become flavor. So you gotta, we got to find freedom so that we can discover purpose. And then when you find purpose, oh, baby, watch out. You're going to start making a difference. And when you start making a difference, fulfillment's going to come in. And then ain't nobody going to be able to stop you. The devil, John, Joe, Gene. The jelly bean. Ain't nobody going to be able to stop you when you start. You'll be like this, kicking down. You'll be like, meh, meh, meh. I wish somebody would step in front of me right now. I will baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? But you can't do one without the other. But the problem is, is we're following the customs of the world. And what we have done is we all would agree those four things are what we want. We would agree. But the problem is we have flipped them upside down. And what we are doing is we are seeking after trying to make a difference first. We want significance. And then when we become significant, we'll discover what our purpose is. And then when we discover what our purpose is, we think it's going to lead to our freedom. And then, you know, at the end, we'll go ahead and, you know, after I've done all that I want to do, then I'll get into a relationship with God. But that ain't how it works, y'all. So because the world does it that way, I was like, well, you know what, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach it that way. Cause so last week we did make a difference. This week we're going to talk about purpose. How many of you in here again want to figure out what your purpose is? Let me see. Come on. We're about to find out. Come on. Elbow your neighbor. Say, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. Why is it so important? Well, let me give you some information because you know I like information. So let me give you some information first. Listen to this, Dan. Incredible. When we look at the church... The body of Christ. Everybody say body. It's the body of Christ. When we look at the body of Christ, 87% of the people in the body of Christ don't know what their purpose is. See, I set you up. You see all them hands? 87%. Now that's a lot, which means 13%. The body of Christ is operating on a 13% efficiency. I want you to imagine for a second. Everybody in here got an imagination. Praise God. All of us in here are in a body because I can see you. I want you to think for a moment what your body would look like and how you would operate if 87% of it didn't know what it was supposed to do. If you had 13% functionality, which you would be like, well, I need my heart. (laughs) I need my, so the inner, if 13% of your physical body was actually functioning and 87% wasn't, how effective could you be? It would be difficult. Could we agree? Could you do something? Yes. Right? Is there purpose? Yes. Would it be hard? 
So when we look at the church and why the church is struggling, is the enemy withholds purpose because if he can withhold purpose, he can withhold proficiency. Look at what God is doing on 13% here. What if we were at 50? That's three times. What if we got to 75? Oh my God, what if we were actually able to get to 100% of the people in this church who knew exactly what they were designed to do and they were walking in that calling? I'm telling you, there wouldn't be enough places or people. You hear me? Everybody would be walking around. You'd be like, hey, I want to invite you. Like, yeah, I go to that church too. You'd be like, well, let me talk to you about Jesus. Yeah, he's my savior. Like, it would be good. You know, you'd be just walking around. We'd be like, this would be like, they would make a movie about us. Like, man, we went to Ashtabula County. Everybody in the whole county is saved. They're all Christians. We don't know what the heck's going on. Right? Can you imagine? Right? They have zero crime. You know, drugs can't even come in. Like, it's like, wait, it's crazy. Right? It would be like, what? It's like the holy city on earth. And, and listen, it's not because we're holy. It's just because he's holy. Right? And he redeemed us. And we're better together than we are apart. Because my body is better when it's working together than when one part is operating outside of the other parts. See, your body is better when your mind and your body are working together than it is when your mind and your body are not working together. Which is why Jesus said that he would transform us by the renewing of our... Because you can do different, but are you thinking different? So you can do the work, but be trapped and bound in your mind. Prison and bondage is bondage, whether it's physical or mental. Bondage is bondage. So then we've got to talk about this because if 87% of the people are struggling with it, well, let's talk about it because Romans 12 and 2 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of the world. We're following the wrong leader. It's not Instagram. It ain't Facebook, TikTok. Blick block, be real, be fake, whatever you want to call it. You know what I'm saying? Period slay, as my kids would say. I don't even know what that means. I just was like, somebody was like, period slay. I was like, is that good? Like, you know, because I need to know what's coming out your mouth. You know what I'm saying? Like, but it says what? Be transformed. Why? We transform the way that we think so that we can learn to know God's what? Purpose, will. We can't understand who he is until we know who he is. You don't know why you were created until you know the creator. So we've got to discover our identity. Say, show me, God. All right, so come on, let's roll, let's roll, let's roll. So if God has a purpose and a destiny for our lives, we got to know that we have an enemy as well. I want you to realize that you have an enemy as it relates to your purpose. If God cannot steal your soul, or if the devil can't steal your soul, meaning send you to hell because you're redeemed, what he will settle for is your purpose and design. He did that with Samson. Right? I'll steal, I'll steal your design, and, and then what happened? Samson, it cost him his life. Right? So he'll settle for that. So then we've got to understand that there are some enemies. The first enemy that you have to your purpose is confusion. The Bible says that the devil is the author of confusion. In other words, he wrote the book. So what we're doing is we're struggling with, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I should do. I kind of feel like. And and we got all these confusing. Got so-and-so said this about me, and I was at church, and the pastor, and he said, and I felt, and it, you know what I'm saying? And we're just mixed up in our head. I feel like I should do this, but I'm really afraid to do it because if I do that, what's going to happen with this? And then we just get confused behind what it is that we were called and created to do. But probably the number one killer is actually the second one, which is comparison. We're so busy focusing on other people's callings and purposes that we neglect our own. We want to be somebody else so bad that we can't be who God actually created us to be. We can't. You know, I want, man, Pastor Faye, Pastor, I want Pastor Faith's portion. You know, she look good, dress good, she got a good man. Come on, I thought you was going to stand up and be like, you know, like. <laughs> like, I, you know, and then we start, want, listen, it's okay to, to, hey, like, what did you, how are you, in, that's, that's better together. 
What it's not is I'm so focused on you that I've neglected that God actually has something for me, right? So, so God has a portion, he says, for all of us. The question is, is what's your portion? So we can't look at what so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so are doing. We can look at what they're doing, but we can't try to become who they are. You're not them, you're you. And the Bible says you are uniquely and wonderfully made. You might be missing out because your portion may actually be better than their portion, but you don't know. Which leads to the third enemy, and the third enemy is he just always brings a counterfeit. The dude is the fakest of the fake, fake, fake game. It's all a counterfeit. What do you mean? You're looking for significance, so you try to get a better job to make more money, but let me tell you something. You don't need a career. You need a calling to find significance. You got to work. Look at your neighbor say, you got to work. Look at him again. Say, the Bible says, if you don't work, you can't eat. And say, I don't know about you, but I like to eat. So look at him again. Say, we need to work. But listen, we also need to have a calling. And our calling and our career can't compete. Because one is for eternity and one is for a moment. So when we're looking at significance, when we're looking at, you know, uh, making a difference, when we're looking at the, the, the long game, the big game, the grand prize, we've got to understand that there's a calling that God has assigned to us. And what I want you to understand is this, is that your calling or your purpose, everybody wants to know. But your purpose was actually created before you were. That's why it's being hidden from you. That's why the enemy is trying to distract you. Because before God made you, he made your purpose. God didn't make you and say, ooh, Pastor Faith, she's born and like, you know what, this is what we're going to do with that. Because that would be God settling for who you are. God created a great purpose, and then he created you to fit that purpose. Which lets me know that, guess what? You're already ready for who you were created to be. The purpose and calling in your life has already been established even before you were. The Bible actually says in Psalms 139, David says, For you created my inmost being. You know everything. He said, You knit me together in my mama's womb. He said, I praise you because I am what? fearfully and wonderfully made your works are wonderful and I know that full well I'm confident I'm not cocky I'm just confident I know who I am and he said my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place he said when I was woven together in the depths of the earth your eyes saw my unformed body all the days ordained for me were written in your book before, everybody say before. before, one of them came to be. I want you to know right now, there is nothing you will do, will ever be able to do, say, or believe that will separate you from the purpose that God has for you. Because it's who you are. You were made for this. Your purpose wasn't made for you. You were made for your purpose. Don't you ever forget that. You're qualified. Say, I'm qualified. But we know that there's a problem because we're following the wrong leader, because we're following the ways of the world. But what do I believe God is saying today? I want you to write this down or take a picture. I believe that when we know God's design, so God's design in me, when we understand his design, it'll reveal his destiny. God's design in me will reveal God's destiny for me. When we get to know him, we'll get to know us. Because we were created in the image and likeness of who? Him. So listen, I tell my kids, look at y'all, listen, y'all wanna get to know who you are, you need to get to know me, because y'all were created in, y'all like me. 
You want to know why you think like that, act like that? Come talk to them. Come talk to them. Come talk to me. That's why we're like God. Because you create like him. We look like him. They look like us. Y'all not ready. I'm going to preach that on a different day. So then what does that have to do with our purpose? Well, this is what it has to do, Cody. Because I've found in life that dissatisfaction actually comes from using something outside of what it was intended for. You get dissatisfied and discouraged when you try to use something outside of what, it's cre- what it was created for. When you try to wash your dishes in your washing machine and it won't work, you'll be dissatisfied. But it isn't just your dishes, it's your marriage. When your marriage is messed up because you're not doing it as the Bible told us we ought to do it, and you're, it's not, it was created this way, we're trying to do it that way, and guess what? We're not happy. We're not, and I could go, the list could go, blip, blip, blip. I could go all the way up the list, down the list. But I'll tell you 100% of the time, dissatisfaction comes from misuse. Misuse. So then what does that have to do? Because pastor, like, I'm following you. You're talking real good, but help me to understand. Well, we do most of this stuff in what we call our on-ramp tier that the church called City Steps. Right after this service, we're going to have City Steps. Step number two. Y'all should, they should have to move it in here because all y'all stayed. Because we're talking about purpose. And when we're looking at our purpose and our design, we've got to begin to ask some questions so that we can discover what it is we were created to do and in, in, in who we are. Because when I found out what my purpose was, I'm walking in my calling and purpose right now. It's undeniably like everybody else knew, but it took me a while to know. Like, I know I'm doing what I was created to do, and that isn't to fill rooms. My calling and purpose is to lead people on their journey with Christ so that they can discover who they are, who they were created to be, and they can find fulfillment and go reach other people. That's why God created me. And I'm blessed that I get to do it. I love doing it. Everybody's like, how come you have so much energy? You want to know why I have so much energy? Because I have so much joy. Why do I have so much joy? Because I'm doing what I was made to do. Y'all like, man, I thought, how do you do that? Why are you like that? Because I know what I was created for. And I'm excited about it. I wake up fulfilled about it. I'm kicking the devil in the teeth. Yeah. About it. And it's exciting. So you want that PT energy? Let's find out. So what does it look like? Well, we've got to start to ask some questions. One of the first questions we got to ask ourselves is, what are our natural talents? If God created you for the purpose, then that means naturally you ought to have some tendencies for that purpose. So what are your natural talents? What abilities do you naturally possess? You know, some people naturally are gifted at whatever that is. It's leading you somewhere. So what are your natural gifts? What are your natural abilities? Ask yourself the question, what what are my natural talents? The second question are, what spiritual gifts? What are your primary motivational gifts? What are the things that motivate you? I get really motivated when I think about women and children in sex trafficking. It does something to me that it's not okay and it compels me to wanna do something about it. I don't know what it is for you. For me, like what motivates me is lost people. It's because I was lost. I'm talking about I was lost, y'all. Not like, I wasn't like, oh well everybody's a sinner, Uh uh-uh, I was lost. So I'm motivated by helping lost people become found. What is it for you? What is it? What are your inward desires? What do you really, really, really want to do? What do you really want to do? What are the results in the fruit that you're already producing? What is it that we can look at right now in you that's already producing fruit. What is it? 
where does your life produce the most? Next is affirmation and recognition. What do others affirm about you? Most of the time, other people will see something in you before you ever see it. Dang, girl, you could sing. For real? I can't sing. No, you can sing for real. You, and they, they see, they're, they're affirming you. You should, you're a leader. You're whatever. You're great. You're really creative. What are other people? And then the next one is, is uh, Jesus. Passions and convictions. What are you compelled to pursue? What are your convictions? Right? Like I said, for me, it's lost people. I have experienced the love in the life of Christ, and I know every lost person wants what I got. Now I just got to get it to them. What's your conviction? What, what is the, the, that, that thing in you? And then finally, circumstances and opportunity. What opportunity is in front of you right now? What's in front of you? What's the open door? Now listen, every open door isn't a good door. Look at your neighbor and say, yeah, that'll preach. So this isn't about being random. It's about being obedient. So how do we know if it's a good open door? We go to our leader. We doesn't line up with the word. Because if we're a part of the body, then as we expand the body, shouldn't, shouldn't the body be a part of the expansion? Doesn't that make sense? Because if not, then that means we have a deformity. And that's not what God created. You were created perfectly and wonderfully. So, so then what does that look like for me as an individual? You got to go to City Steps because I ain't giving you all the questions and all the answers. He said, Amen. Right? You was like, oh, man, forget City Steps. I got seven questions. I'm going to try to figure these out right now. No, you got to go to City Steps so that we can help you to discover your purpose, your gift, your talent, what's your personality, and then we can get you connected so that 87% of the body isn't trying to figure, isn't wondering. We're actually figuring it out. Right? We're figuring it out. But what does that look like in real life? Well, let me tell you. So you know me, I'm not going to say anything, Shane, or do anything if it doesn't line up with the word. Otherwise, it's just good talk, motivation. But what does God say? So I actually began to look, and I found four ways that God used in the Bible to help people identify their purpose. Four things that he would do. And the first thing was there would be a call from birth. There would be a calling. From the time that you were a child, you would have a sense that there was something bigger than you that you wanted to do. And I want to help dogs, cats, people, whatever. There's this greater calling. Where you, as a child, dreamed of significance because you are significant. So from the beginning, you have this sense of more. There's this more in you that bubbles. We'll say things like, I always felt like I was supposed to, right? But then you made a couple bad decisions and... Then you ended up getting married. That wasn't a bad one. Come on, that was, I probably shouldn't have said it that way. <laughs> right? You had some kids. You got a whole lot of bills. Now you got to work all the time. You know, like you got all this stuff that happened. But, you, but when you were young, you dreamed of significance, of making a difference. There was an impact in you that you had from the time you were a child. I can look at Jeremiah as an example. The prophet Jeremiah, the Lord, was speaking to him. And when you look at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse number 5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before we started talking about sex, you were on my mind. And he says, before you were born, I set you apart. 
And he says, I appointed you. In other words, I gave you a purpose as a prophet to the nations. And then Jeremiah did what we all do. But God, I'm only young, I'm child. 13, 14, 15, I don't have the education, I don't talk well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, bills, what, excuse, 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 excuse. And God fires back at Jeremiah in the next verse, and he said, but the Lord said to me, don't say I'm too young. In other words, he said, shut up. Look at your neighbor and say, God bless you. Right, you wanted to say, shut up. Right? He said, shut up. Don't say you're too young. He said, you must go to everyone that I send you to and say whatever I command you to say. In other words, I need you to stop making excuses and start walking in significance. Amen. So I started to think about that. I'm like, well, God, like, is that? And then God reminded me. He said, let me remind you. Let me tell you something, Tony. When my mom... I was probably in my early 20s. My mom and I, our relationship was rocky, got really good. It's really good now. But it was rough in the beginning. And she was telling me she, she saw this. And she said, you know, when I was pregnant with you, when I was 16, I was at Grandpa's farm and I was walking in the field. And everybody was trying to tell me, you're 16, you can't have a baby. You got to, you're going to have to get an abortion. Like, it's not okay. 16 and in the 70s wasn't okay. And she said, I went into the field and I just started walking. And I was trying to figure out I wasn't, didn't have a relationship with God, but I was calling out to him. And she said, and God spoke to me. And he told me, and I didn't even know that you were going to be a boy, but she said, he said, if you'll have them, I'll make them great. Even before I, you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. And I appointed you. There's an appointment in your life. There's an appointment. See, for all of us, there's been a calling, and that calling has been sounding out since we were in our mother's womb. But the second thing is God will use is a growing awareness. Meaning if you don't catch it when you're young, you'll start to figure it out as you grow. This happened with Joseph. Joseph had a dream, two dreams, and unfortunately, he didn't have a lot of sense because he told his brothers his dream. Let me tell you, if you have siblings, don't tell your brothers or sisters your dream, especially if you're the baby, because Joseph's dream was like, hey, y'all, I had this dream. It was crazy. They were like, oh, for real, Joe, what's going on? He was like, yeah, man, it was so good, man. It was crazy. You guys were bowing down to me. <laughs> and they were like, what? What do you mean? Like, yeah, man, in the dream, pff, stars. Hey, and you, we're all bowing down to Joe. And the Bible was like, they was like, mm, okay, bow down. And then they threw that brother in a pit. Look like you bowing down, Joe. And then the Bible says he went from the pit, got sold into slavery. See, this is that growing awareness. You had a dream when you were a kid. But somehow you shared that and things started to fall apart and now you're getting hurt and you found yourself at the bottom and you're in a pit. And then when he got to the pit, he got sold into slavery, he ended up in Potiphar's house. He was in Potiphar's house trying to do the right thing, which is what most of you are trying to do. And while he was there, he got accused of something he actually didn't do. But just because he was trying to be good didn't mean good was happening to him. So he ended up in prison. Bound for most of his life. But he had a dream. And the dream actually came from God. But the thing about Joseph that we neglect to realize is that while he was in the prison, he didn't let the prison overtake him. He overtook the prison. (laughs) 
And eventually what happened was an opportunity presented itself. A baker and a butler end up in the prison. Pharaoh has a dream. Nobody can interpret it. Joseph had interpreted one of their dreams. They get released, go to Pharaoh. They're like, hey, man, nobody knows what this dream means. He was like, hey, man, I know this dude Joe in jail. He's a good dude. You guys might want, and they go get Joe. Joe listens to Pharaoh. God gives Joseph the revelation. He tells Pharaoh exactly what the dream means. And then Pharaoh takes him out of the prison, cleans him up, and says to Joseph, only in regards to the throne will I be greater than you. But everything else that you see is yours. Just this chair is mine. And what ended up happening was J Joseph saved two nations. Two. He saved Egypt and his people, the Jews. See, when you look at his story, it looked like every turn he made was the wrong turn, but God took every wrong turn and made it right. And then we see, <laughs> amen. And we see one of my favorite scriptures, Genesis 50, 20. One of my favorite scriptures is Joseph says this. This is one of those scriptures you need to like put on your mirror. And he says this, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. See, your whole life has been crazy. And the enemy meant to use all of those things to destroy you. But God, say but God, but God intended it for good. Why? To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. When I look at my past, I preach about my past, I talk about my past, I'm not ashamed of my past because I know it's being used to help set people free. So that's what God wants. There's this growing awareness where we no longer allow our shame to cripple us. Stop hiding from your shame. Let God use your shame to set other people free. Let him use it for people who are struggling right now. Because God wants to use you to become freedom for somebody else. Say amen. amen. Number three. The third way that they, people would discover their purpose is just through open doors. And I'm going to blast through this one really fast. We could look at the, the, the um, woman Esther, the queen, actually, Queen Esther. Esther was a woman, a Jewish woman, who came from a broken home. Both her parents were dead. She was living with her uncle. She was a Jew living in a Babylonian culture. Like, everything around her was off, bad, and ugly. The king at the time had a wife, beautiful wife, and they were getting ready to have a party, and he told his wife, hey, get dressed up, look real good, and I want you to walk around and basically like prance around so everybody can see how beautiful my wife is. Yeah, I see some of y'all ladies looking like, no, he didn't say that. I, yes, he did, and she did just what you did. No, you didn't say that. And he actually was like, oh, you're not going to do it? You're out. Kicked her out. She was no longer the queen. And then he said, go get me the most beautiful women in the land. And they got a whole bunch of women. A few of them were Jews. And one of them was Esther. The king looked at him, pointed to Esther, said, you're my queen. Boom. In a moment, she became queen. But what she didn't realize and what her uncle Mordecai actually said to her is that, listen, you're not queen because you happen to be at the right place at the right time. You're queen because God has a purpose. And when we look at Esther chapter 4, verse number 14, it says, Mordecai says to her, if you remain silent at this time, because what was going on was there was this group of individuals who were trying to annihilate the Jewish people. The enemy has been just trying to kill off the Jewish race for a very long time. It wasn't just the Holocaust. And this was in action. And Mordecai said, listen, God has put you next to the king so you could have his ear. And it says, but if you remain silent, at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from some other place. We can't just sit here and not figure out why we were created and what we need to do. Because if we do, God will go get somebody else. 
and God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect. I want that. I want that. And he says, not only will it affect you, but you and your father's family are going to perish. It's going to affect the people around you. He said, and who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. I don't know why you're here at church. I hope you're here because you just like it. I hope you're here because there's some great people here. I hope you're here because you can find love. But I want you to be here because I want you to grow. I want you to become. I want to see you flourish. I want to see you walk in a destiny, in a fulfillment that you dreamed of when you were a child. Because that's why you were created. You weren't created to do a job. You were created to make a difference. Which leads me to the fourth thing. And the fourth way that people have discovered their purpose is through a God encounter. See, Saul had this happen. In Acts 9, verse number 1, the Bible says this about Saul. And I don't know anybody in this room who is as bad as Saul. Because the Bible says about Saul, it says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Saul was a hitman for Christians. He was killing them. And it goes on to say that he went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, they didn't call it Christianity back then, they said you belong to the way. I am the way, the truth in it. And it says, it says, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. That's what Saul was looking like. But the Bible says as they neared his location, his desired pathway, that on his journey, suddenly, that's what I'm believing for today. Suddenly. Suddenly there was a moment that stopped all time. That stopped his journey, his walk. It stopped his dreams, his way. And the Bible said he fell to the ground. And when he fell to the ground, Jesus called out to him and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Do you notice that Jesus right here is telling Saul, Saul didn't know Jesus. But we are the body of Christ. So when we come against the individual we're sitting next to, when we come for those believers, the church, we're not coming for them. You're coming for Jesus. That'll change your perspective. He said, why are you persecuting who? Me. And Saul said, who are you? I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And then it said that Jesus said, now get up. Get up and go to the, well, praise the Lord. Y'all, we in the Bible. And you will be told what you must do. Boy, that's good. So stand to your feet. God encounter. I want to share with you guys a quick little story. Because right now there's a reverence that is trying to come into the room. 
Because God encounters are real. And for many of you in here, that is exactly what you need to unlock your purpose. And for me, that's exactly what happened. I had a God encounter. When I was 14 years old, I went to church with my mom and we were in youth group and they had this overhead projector. For those of you who are under the age of 40, basically it's this light where they put this plastic sheet on top of that projected onto the wall. And they had the lyrics to a song and they put this cassette tape. I know I'm really going back. And they put it in this boom box radio and they hit play. And I was sitting there, standing there actually just like you. A bunch of teenagers waiting for the song to hurry up and start so it could hurry up and end. And then the song came on. And the song began to sing about an awesome God. And while I was standing there and the music was coming out of that little radio, our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Tears begin to just flow down my face. And the room began to fill around me. And as I was crying, I was looking and nobody else was experiencing this God encounter. Because my whole life I've been imperfect. But my whole life I've been chosen. My whole life when I've done the wrong thing, my whole life I knew it was wrong. Nobody had to tell me. Nobody had to show me. My whole life I fought the conviction of going the wrong way. Until one day I had another encounter sitting on the steps of a crack house on Station Avenue eating a bag of munchos and drinking a 50-50 pop. The Lord sat next to me. And I began to cry again. Remembering this awesome God. And saying to myself, there has to be more than this. I don't know what it is, God but there's got to be more. And I went to church. Broken, busted, disgusted, wounded, but hungry. I was so hungry. I was so hungry for something more. And then the last time, God found me in Australia. I was serving his church, loving his people. And he said, do you trust me? And as I'm sitting there standing, God said, do you trust me? I said, God, I trust you. He said, then build my church. It's easy to follow him. It's hard to trust him when you're unqualified. It doesn't make sense. And he's asking you to do what can only be done if he does it, not you. And here I look around at the fruit of a God encounter. Can I ask you right now? What would God do? What could he do? 
if you would just allow him right now to fully come and invade your heart, fully invade your life, where you would fully surrender to him, what could he do? Would you just close your eyes for a moment? Because in the stillness of what's happening right now, God is in the room. The same awesome God he was when I was 14 is the same awesome God he is right now. And the truth of the matter is, just like you, I had my own agenda and plans and dreams. But his dreams, his agenda, and his plans were so much greater. And some may argue that I've missed out on some things, but I would also say I've experienced some things that other people will never experience in their life. And every good thing that God has given me has been worth it every time. So right now, I'm gonna ask you in this moment to just allow him to invade your heart. Father, I pray God that right now that every hardened heart would be softened. Every wall would begin to fall. Every lie would perish. Every generational curse would be cast down. God, I pray that right now, God, you would begin to renew our minds, knowing, God, that our purposes weren't made for us, but we were made for our purpose. God, I pray that right now, God, that you would awaken something inside of us, that you would begin to stir the gifts up inside of us, God. God, that you would take us back to the beginning. Oh, where we first found you, where we first loved you, where we believed, God, that anything was possible. So right now, God, I pray that you would help us to trust you. Help us, God, right now to believe in you, God, and what you've called and created us to do. Father, right now, I pray that you would surround us with people who would encourage our gift. People who would speak into our gift. People who will see in us what we don't see in ourselves. Father, we're seeking the more on this morning. More of you, less of us. So, Father, we surrender who we are, what we are, our agenda, and we exchange it for yours. This morning, we say yes. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. Whatever you want, whatever you need. My answer to you is yes. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on.